As is the ever tradition of the preview guides, I'm running behind. It's more than a week into a season, and I'm already almost a week behind on the anime I'm reviewing. The good news is I'm trying to speed up writing these. The bad news is there's more fun one this weekend. Whatever, I'll catch up at some point. So join me as I look at four more shows, because this is the 2018 Spring Anime Preview, from a different perspective. It's a well-known fact that people work best when they're brought into groups of people with similar interests. That's how it seems to go in anime, as club-based anime always seems to make an appearance every season. Now, Comic Girls isn't really what I'd call a club anime, but it does feature girls being brought together with similar goals and dreams. So in that respect, I'm going to lump it together with other club anime. I hope you don't mind. But yeah, we introduced our four main girls this episode and their situation. First, we have the adorable klutzy high school girl, Karaku Maeta, who goes by her pen name, Chaos. Now she's an aspiring manga artist, specialising in four comma four panel manga. She has only one problem, she can't draw more mature grown up looking girls. She moves to the Bunhosha dormitory, a sort of commune where up and coming manga artists can live amongst their peers and grow as a community. She's joined as a newbie by shoujo manga artist Kayomi Kurizuka. She doesn't really act like you'd expect a shoujo manga artist to act. Though, having seen Monthly Girls and Azaki kun I can understand expectations can be a little... Yeah. Kayomi's problem is that she can't draw guys. Girls are no problem, but guys? No sorry. Already residents of the apartments are the amusing truly powered shonen artist Tsubasa Katsuki and Ruki Iroka, who goes by the sadly false pen name of Big Boobies Himiko and draws teen love manga. Yeah, that type of manga. We don't really get much in the first episode beyond the basic character introductions and information about the setting. All in all, it reminded me a whole lot of Hidamari's sketch. Karaku has a whole lot in common with Yuno, and hyper-energetic hyper blonde bombshell Kayomi shares a lot of her traits with Miyako. There's even some level of comparison with Ruki and Tsubasa, but less obvious. Not that being reminiscent of Hidamari's sketch would ever be a bad thing. I believe really love that series, and being compared to it can only be a compliment. If you do want to watch Comic Girls for yourself, it's on at Crunchyroll. I'm not a very sporty person. You just have to take a look at a face cam to get an idea of that. But being a sporty person has nothing to do with watching sports anime. And I do enjoy some sports and sports anime in general as well. Sadly for Megalo Box, boxing is just one sport I just don't like. I'm not going to go into why I think that, but that didn't stop me from at least trying Megalo Box. The first thing that strikes me as watching it is how old it looks. And not in a bad way either. Megalo Box is animated in a very 90s way. I could almost be watching a show from the 90s. The animation is intentionally very dated and the art is beautiful. There's none of a modern CG or glossy finishing here. It's rough, looks hand-drawn, but it's meant to be. And then there's a plot. Our lead guy is an underground boxer taking part in crooked fights for a terrible manager, who never lets him take a fight seriously. Junk Dog is clearly frustrated, as he wants to be something bigger in this, but as an unlicensed resident and not a citizen, he's never going to hit a big time. Just as this is going on, there's a big news story. Yukito Shirato, the head of a company that oversees and controls the biggest professional boxing tournaments, has a brand new venture planned. A huge tournament, open to every citizen who wants to enter. A perfect way for Junk Dog to finally make a name for himself. Or, it would be, if he were a citizen. Throw in Shirato's bodyguard and favourite for a tournament getting a grudge against him, and you have a plotline. Really, as a reimagining of the original Ashita no Joe story, I think there's a whole lot to like about the way we got about this particular remake. Rather than taking the path most anime are going and just bringing reanimation up to modern standards, they're intentionally giving it an older feel, and a modern visual style as well. The action is very real, 
and entertaining to watch. Even myself, who, by my own mission, I'm not drawn to boxing as a sport. Found plenty of it here to enjoy. Now, if you are a fan of classic anime, sports anime, or just anime in general, and don't share my dislike for the sport, there's a whole lot here that will interest you. If you do want to watch more of Megalobox, you can find it at Crunchyroll. My next show disappointed me greatly. I was expecting a really interesting story about a former dragon slayer finding a tribe of dragons and instead of killing them, joining their tribe and becoming a part of their community. I didn't expect there to be a Kevin Costner character, but it would have been cool too. Sadly, Dancing with Dragons isn't a series like this. Oh boy, it's nothing like this. You need to take a look at their names in order to get an idea what we're in for with this show. A lead guy has a rather sensible name and appearance, even if at times it looked like a kid's head on an adult's body. Meet Gaia Slovena Sorel, a maid who hunts dragons, I think that's what he does anyway, because the entire plot of a series has given away the most techno babble tuny crap I've ever heard in my life. He has a girlfriend, which is unusual for a show like this, and he, he, he treats her like crap, and a partner who really needs to learn teamwork lessons. And the subject of his partner, and as you can see why Gaia Slavina Sorel is considered a more sensible name, we meet Gagina Jerry Dolk Melios Ashley Buff. Yep, that is his name. I've got it written down so I can actually remember the damn thing. I think by the time he's introduced himself, a person standing listening has already buggered off, knowing they don't want to be in an anime like this. You know, in story writing there are two main ways to reveal plot and a background points. This show, I must tell. A good story writer combines the two. You don't want to rely on your reviewer noticing everything. But some background hints and knowledge can make a show feel deeper. Dances with the Dragons is pretty much a 100% tell series. It doesn't expect you to see anything, as even things that happen it tells you about anyway. It's as if the author didn't want to write a background, but have her characters talk like it's a radio drama, and we have to describe everything since we can't see it. Well, I have one thing right at least. I won't be seeing any carefully hidden plot points here, since I won't be seeing any more of this tripe. It's very rare for me to actually quit an anime halfway through an episode, but I was seriously tempted here. Do yourself a favour and skip this one, even if it is streaming on Crunchyroll. It's quite rare to find a truly original concept in anime. Usually you can liken a series to another one or two. It's like Love Live but with llamas, or it's like an isekai smartphone, but good. And so when I started watching My Sweet Tyrant, I was not surprised to see that it was just like a wonderful Momokuri, only creepy and not as funny. Mama Curry was a sweet romantic comedy short about a stalker girl being asked out by her crush and their healthy and rather unhealthy relationship. And our sweet pair of lead characters and despite Yuki being a little bit obsessive, they were really fun to watch. The two lead characters in My Sweet Tyrant on the other hand are just boring. It's a guy who's a stalker this time but rather than giving a girl a cute personality, she is kind of without a personality. She's an oblivious cute girl who just thinks that things are cute. Anyone with even half a brain cell would be able to see that if you're dating someone who verbally abuses you like like but verbally abuses you like like lead guy Atsuhiro Kagari does to a non to, to a girl non Katagari, then you're not in a good relationship or a bit playing a Reki Kawahara story. I think he's supposed to be Sundera, but he just comes across as being a bit of a jerk, really. And the creepiness only grows when he's stalking his girlfriend, breathing heavily behind lampposts and collecting random knickknacks for only just partless crimes. If you are interested in stalker-based romantic comedy, you need to go and watch Mama Kuri. The story of Akun's unhealthy relationship with that nondescript blank canvas that is Nontan it's not even worth a three minutes of runtime. If you do want to, if you do want to stalk it, go to Crunchyroll. Well, today was quite a mixed bag, wasn't it? I gotta be honest, I didn't expect to give a green to that one series. Although after watching them, I definitely expected to give red to the other two. 
What did you think of this series? Let me know in the comments. And thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye.